You are listening to Pass the Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 6. On this week's episode, we'll find out how Mexican builders, who are famous for the generous communal meals, celebrate their day. We learn how hot chocolate was a shared passion between Catholic monks from colonial Mexico and 17th century English Quakers. And we'll meet Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, a rebel nun who found intellectual comfort in making kitchen philosophy. Well, hello, hello. You are listening to Pass the Chipotle, the audible companion of Sabor. This is Mexican food magazine, the tastiest combo to guide you into the kitchens, markets, streets, and traditions that make Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food historian, cook, and author. To find more information about this project, please visit PassTheChipotle.com. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. I'm really thankful for all your comments about the show and the magazine. All right then, without any more delay, let's get on with the show. Mexico, like most Christian countries, has many traditions and festivities that actually date back to ancient quote-unquote pagan rites and celebrations. In pre-Columbian times, the fifth month or Metztli was dedicated to Tlaloc, the Nahuatl god of rain. These celebrations marked the beginning of the growing season. However, at the arrival of Christianism to Mexico, many friars and monks decided to get resourceful and adapted an ancient celebration established by the Emperor Constantine called the Feast of the Cross that used to take place on September the 14th, but they changed it to May the 3rd. Nowadays, there's many hybrid celebrations that take place during the whole month of May. For instance, in the state of Puebla, located in the central high plains of Mexico, Special weather shamans called Tiemperos climb up the steep paths that lead to the volcanoes Popocatépetl and Ixtaccíhuatl, carrying crosses, flowers, candles, and incense. Once they reach the sacred streams and waterfalls, they pray, sing, and perform dances, asking San Isidro, patron of rains, for his blessings and to the guardian spirits of the mountains to keep the crops safe from hail, droughts, and plagues. But what does that have to do with builders, I hear you ask? It turns out that Constantine's mother, Saint Helena, who converted to Christianism, started a quest to find the cross of Christ, which she eventually found in 1326. A huge site was excavated to find the cross and afterwards in that same place, she commissioned the construction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the cross is still kept. But since this quest required the continuous hard work of builders, it was decided that after the consecration of this temple, on September the 13th, 1335, builders were also celebrating for having taken part in this great project. But as I mentioned before, the Spanish friars and monks in Mexico saw convenient to adjust Catholic celebrations to overlap the indigenous rites of May with the festivities of the Holy Cross. The Spanish word for builder is albañil, and it actually comes from two Arab words. One is alarife and the other is albani. Both used to refer to masons and builders. I am the daughter of an architect, so I grew up enjoying the celebratory meals that builders, contractors, and homeowners used to prepare and eat together. These experiences certainly allowed me to learn and understand the importance of appreciating and giving recognition to the people that build the homes we live in. 
Over the years, I learned about their generosity, camaraderie, and of course, their favorite meals. Let me walk you through the food of a proper builder's festive menu. The meals usually take place at the construction site. Communal tables are prepared and everybody sits, share and enjoy as equals. It doesn't matter what is served. It always has to be accompanied by tortillas to make as many tacos as you can handle. The dishes available are often presented in big earthenware pots or cazuelas. The unmissable are barbecued mutton or misiotes, beef steak with onions and potatoes, fried or grilled cactus, chorizo with potatoes, pork scratchings in green sauce, and Mexican rice. Sometimes mole and chicken consomme are also served. The preferred drinks to wash down all that delicious food are usually cold soft drinks. The classic flavors are tamarind, pineapple, grapefruit, strawberry, and lime. But cold beers are always welcome too. In Mexico, there are at least three occasions in which homeowners and architects offer builders a big meal. One is when the foundations of a house are finished, the second when the roof is built, and the third when the house is completed. These three events are huge milestones and an excellent excuse to throw a meal. On every other workday, albañiles often cook their own meals. Usually they start by building an open fire with timber leftovers. Then they roast chicken or chorizo or beef steaks, chiles, onions, and prepare or carry a good salsa and plenty of tortillas. It really doesn't require much to make a filling and delicious lunch. On May the 3rd, the day of the Holy Cross, builders traditionally make a cross, big or small, repurposing leftover materials from the construction sites, and they attend a special service where the local priest or even a bishop will say a special mass for them and proceed to bless the crosses. Since the designs are really impressive, many towns also make special contests and give power tools and other prizes to the lucky winners. The way Christianism took shape in Mexico is full of intricate stories and ancient traditions that are as complex as they're fascinating. But in this case, like in many others, it ends with a happy and delicious meal. So here is a toast to all albañiles whose hard work cheerful spirit and generosity teaches great life lessons. We will continue with the show after this message. This podcast is the audible companion of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, a quarterly digital magazine dedicated to the exploration of Mexico's gastronomic heritage and traditions. And I'm happy to share with you the recent release of the summer issue. Under the green cool canopy of the tropical trees in the remote rainforest hills of southeast Mexico grows the cocoa tree, perhaps the only tree that was ever destined to take the world by storm. Of all the products that were part of the Colombian exchange, cocoa's popularity is undiminished and it's more desired and enjoyed now than it ever was in the 16th century when it made its first trip from the Americas to Europe. In the summer issue, a wonderful selection of delicious articles all about cocoa, one of Mexico's greatest gifts to the world its history and heritage recipes for you to enjoy. You can purchase your digital copy now and enjoy it in all your devices. Go to pazdechipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. It is not every day that we see unexpected coincidence between conspicuous food habits amongst religious groups that are centuries apart and even in different continents. But it is one drink in particular that I'm referring to and is the common feature of this story, that is chocolate. 
Thousands of years ago, ancient Mayan priests in Mexico and Central America used the roasted and ground cocoa seeds to prepare a thick, dark drink, seasoned with anato seeds, honey from wild bees, allspice, and powdered chile. At the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors and during the colonial period, the Colombian exchange we have previously talked about on the show brought ingredients and even farming animals and also many cooking techniques, but of course, many more were created here. And these would change food forever, not only in Mexico, but in the rest of the world. The invention or reinvention of drinking chocolate with the addition of milk, sugar, vanilla, cinnamon and almonds, well, pretty much created what we will call today as a food called chocolate, not only captured the imagination and conquered the parlors of the rich and the poor. It also became a favorite drink of colonial cloistered nuns, friars and monks. Their daily rations even included several cups of drinking chocolate and many advocated this consumption. The Spanish historian Leon Pinelo wrote in 1633 that chocolate had enormous restorative powers. It stimulated nocturnal works and it was particularly beneficial when drunk in the morning, then another cup between 9 and 10, another after eating and a last cup between 4 and 5. While some strict religious orders firmly restricted the temptation to succumb to the pleasures of chocolate, some others saw it as a spiritual right to drink several cups a day, to have the strength to fulfill the religious duties. Time traveling to the mid-1800s in England, when the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers, founded by George Fox in the 17th century, based their moral principles on a practice of radical spiritualism, where self-control and the refusal of intoxicating their bodies in any way that would affect their connection to God was a particularly important aspect of their habits. They famously led the prohibition movement in Britain, but a very famous Quaker was responsible for coming up with one of the best business ideas of all time when he created a company that will carry his name and legacy to this day. The name is Cadbury. John Cadbury was born and raised in Birmingham. Like many other Quakers, he was denied access to attend university due to his religious beliefs. But he trained instead as a chocolatier and became very successful. But he observed how alcohol binge drinking became a serious problem in Victorian England. And instead of fighting alcoholism by attacking brewers and consumers, he then came up with an idea to offer something even more tempting than alcohol, safe to consume by people of all ages and with a more appealing flavor than mere tea or coffee. And that drink was chocolate. He created the world's first sweetened cocoa powder to prepare hot cocoa in 1831. And from there, he built a huge empire based on an almost infinite range of chocolate products. What I find particularly curious about this coincidence, and maybe you will too, is that, in a way, drinking chocolate never quite steered too far from having a religious connection. After all, its original creators prepared it for special rites and celebrations. And although our Western ideas, cultural constructions, and even the image of chocolate is quite different from the blood red and richly spiced drink the Mayans used to enjoy, we still tend to associate it with moral implications as being something we deserve a reward, but also a dangerous pleasure, a secret indulgence that could easily turn to gluttony. So next time you enjoy a truffle, a bar, or a cup of hot chocolate, Take a minute to think how far the history of chocolate goes, and yet it is amazing how after navigating the ups and downs of its transcultural travels, it still provokes the same desire as it did more than 2,000 years ago, when the cocoa tree was first domesticated. We'll return with the last segment of the show after this brief message.
The production of Pazza Chipotle requires hours of hard work and dedication to bring you an exciting and refreshing show. To keep this great project alive, your support is vital. Independent creators like myself bring diversity, empowerment and opportunities to enrich our global cultural exchange, which is why the support of audiences with a passion for knowledge and creativity is essential. You can support this show by making a monthly donation on this show's page on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast. By helping the show grow, you will also get great rewards such as exclusive posts, transcripts of the show, delicious recipes, and the chance to choose which topics you would like to hear in future episodes. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast. Every donation makes a big difference. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast and be part of this delicious story. There is a very robust compendium of works studying the life and impact of male religious figures in colonial Mexico. Many of such friars and monks took part in the political life of the country by using the church's power and structure to create a political career for themselves. Some of them, however, opted out for scholarly pursuits and many ended up documenting the rapidly fading indigenous world. Even less of them opted out for a reflective work as philosophers. But the life choices for privileged women in the 16th and 17th century in Mexico were almost reduced to two options, becoming an accomplished lady and finding a suitable husband, run a household and raise a family, or joining a nunnery. Both scenarios could potentially bring great recognition and status to their families, as having a successful marriage was considered just as honorable as having an important connection to the church, thanks to the indisputable virtuosity of the nun-to-be and her very handsome dowry. I am certain that many women who feared the prospect of an arranged marriage or dead facing a lifetime of domestic confinement so the other alternative as a way to maintain their individuality, even if that meant renouncing to have a secular life, but nevertheless escaping a shameful spinsterhood. There is, however, another motivation that may have led some women to join a religious community, and that was having access to formal education, you know, embroidery, dancing, and singing. Surely, the possibility to access a library, learning Latin, arithmetic, history, theology, and philosophy were more attractive, even if it came with the unescapable religious duties of becoming a nun. This really seemed like a very agreeable alternative. That was precisely the case of Juana de Asbaje y Ramírez, the bastard child of a Spanish rural countryman. This girl grew to become the most prominent female poet, writer, satirist, and reluctant cook of her time. Juana was born in 1648 and grew up in a country house where she was provided with private tutors that cultivated her very inquisitive mind. She then moved to Mexico City, where she studied Latin and Nahuatl. Her family's connections allowed her to join the Viceroy's court as a lady-in-waiting, where she had the chance to brush shoulders with many intellectuals and politicians. As time passed, she realized that in order to pursue an intellectual life, she had to join an honorary, and so she did. And, as it was customary, she changed her name to Juana Inés de la Cruz. After a failed attempt to follow a strict religious life in one nunnery, she went on to join another one, the Jerónimite Nunnery, or Convento de las Jerónimas. 
where she had her own private library with more than 4,000 volumes, a maid, a kitchenette, and a very spacious studio. The friendship she developed with a vice-regal couple, which were the representatives of the Spanish king in the colony, granted her all sorts of privileges. She was a fierce critic of the misogynist and retrograde views of high-profile religious men and confronted them directly through letters and published essays quite often signed anonymously. But after all, she was a nun, and sharp as she was, she was also forced to perform duties to her community, and cooking was one of them, which she found particularly tedious, until she saw the possibility to use that time as an opportunity to experiment and even find a sensory pleasure in the analysis of the transformation of ingredients. Sor Juana was eventually censored and forced to sell her library and forbidden from publishing her very dangerous ideas. In spite of this, she did publish a very long, poignant letter to her detractors, in which she uses all sorts of cooking metaphors to mock and defy the status quo. In one passage, she complains that women are reduced to just made kitchen philosophy, and yet she insists that Aristotle would have been a far better writer had he known how to cook. Eventually, she came to enjoy cooking and even wrote her own recipe book with 36 recipes from which I have personally cooked several dishes, including one lush dessert called huevos reales or royal eggs, which is a very rich sponge made with 12 egg yolks, butter, ground almonds and sugar. After baking, this sponge is sliced into squares, then drenched with sugar syrup. After Juana retreated completely from her intellectual works, the population of Mexico City suffered one of the most devastating outbreaks of plague in 1694, affecting Juana's own cloistered community. While nursing her fellow nuns, Juana contracted the plague and died the same year at the age of 46. Sor Juana's genius Sharp humor and fighting spirit certainly outlived her detractors and posthumously gained her many honors. But you might be happy to hear that she lived long enough to know that she was affectionately called the Mexican Phoenix by her readers and supporters. The sometimes romanticized view of femininity and cooking as a nourishing virtue natural to all women turns to be more of a cultural assumption than a fact. Very cleverly, Sor Juana used poetry and philosophy to talk about the transformation of ingredients and making philosophy about the way food creates sensory pleasures and crosses the threshold from a frugal fuel to a sensuous desire and a spiritual connection. Thank you for listening to this episode of Paz de Chipotle, a bi-weekly show dedicated to the exploration of Mexico's delicious gastronomic traditions. On the next episode, we'll talk about the difference between mezcal and tequila, two of the undisputed favorite national drinks of Mexico. Then we'll find out how British miners contributed to the Mexican cookbook and we'll discover the deliciously flavored ices and sorbets that Aztec emperors used to offer their guests in their very lavish banquets. Get in touch with the show via Twitter or email. The links and contact details are in the show's description. Support the show on Patreon, the largest platform that connects creators with bright audiences like you. To find more information about the show and Sabor, this is Mexican food magazine, please go to pazdechipotle.com. That's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe, rate, and share this show. Goodbye for me, or as we say in Mexico, hasta la próxima, amigos. <laughs>